Ring, the celestial event mesmerizing millions across North America. I was planning to be here for it ever since I was 11. The awesome power of the moon's shadow and our Eric Sorensen's own eclipse expedition. Every one of these cars is looking for an eclipse. I'm sure of that. Also on this Monday night, new evidence at the Foreign Interference Inquiry. What CSIS officials told the Prime Minister's office about China meddling in Canadian elections. New defence dollars, what the federal government is pledging for the military, plus the biggest threats Canada is facing. And yet another mid-air scare. The latest alarming moment on a Boeing plane. Global National with Donna Friesen. It's a rare moment when tens of millions of people all stop and look up at the same thing and are mesmerized. The moon slipping between the sun and earth was captivating. NASA live streaming it as it happened. Astronauts on the International Space Station watching the surreal moment as a shadow covered the United States. It's little wonder that since the dawn of time, this celestial event has frightened and fascinated humankind. The path of this total eclipse began at sunrise over the Pacific and moved northeast, carving a swath across Mexico and then from Texas to Maine and into Canada, across a strip of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick and Newfoundland. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Most of North America got a glimpse of the eclipse, but the deepest shadow was in that path of totality when 100% of the sun was obscured. Eclipse chasers from all over the world came to see it, many of them landing in Niagara Falls. That's where Jeff Semple begins our coverage tonight. Daybreak over Niagara Falls, Canada's most popular tourist destination. But on this day, the sun was the star attraction. We are very excited. This family from Toronto arrived at dawn to claim a front row seat. I came here because it's not only my first time, I, I'm sure it's going to be so cool. This group from Algonquin Territory in northern Quebec drove more than 10 hours for a special ceremony. Women are protectors of the waters. It's about giving birth and protecting the, the water. Millions across eastern Canada stepped outside hoping to catch a glimpse of the rare celestial event. And of all the places along its path, Niagara Falls was billed as the biggest, with up to a million visitors, prompting the region to preemptively declare a state of emergency, which may have backfired. And unfortunately, when the region declared a state of emergency, a lot of people cancelled their plans. Still, hundreds of thousands turned out. Niagara Falls set a new Guinness World Record for the most people dressed as the sun. The only thing the city didn't have was good weather. It's up to Mother Nature. Now all we need her to do is move some of her clouds out of the way. This Ontario University is home to a century-old observatory and miniature model. Here's the moon, which is orbiting the Earth. This astronomer says the actual shadow is only about 180 kilometers wide, making it incredibly rare for so many Canadians to find themselves on the path of totality. This literally is a, is a once-in-a-lifetime experience for us to see an event like this. All right, that was it. The moment of total eclipse here in Niagara Falls suddenly felt like somebody turned out the lights. The temperature has really dropped by more than 10 degrees. It was looking like a lunar letdown, too much cloud cover to see anything. But there it is, making a brief appearance through the clouds. A total eclipse here in Niagara Falls, just in time. What did you think? I think it was incredible. Among those experiencing their first total eclipse, the man who's about to become the only Canadian to fly to the moon. I am uh, quite enamored with the moon lately. Astronaut Jeremy Hansen enjoyed the view from Niagara Falls, USA, where NASA studied the atmosphere. This provides a you know, better opportunity to gather some specific data about the sun, which really matters to us. Millions of Canadians united in awe and childlike excitement. And people in northwestern Canada will have their turn during our next total eclipse in 2044. Jeff Semple, Global News, Niagara Falls. 
Eclipse chasers always pray for cloudless skies, but a scientist in New Brunswick devised a way, thanks to a helium balloon, cameras, and a team of volunteers, to rise above them and give people around the world a captivating look at the eclipse as it happened. As Heidi Petrachik explains, they lucked out. Countless hours of work have led up to this, and they couldn't have ordered up a better day. Put a lot of work into this thing, but the team has done really well, and uh, we've completely lucked out with the weather. But things soon became a race against time to launch their huge helium balloon, carrying an array of cameras to capture images of the total solar eclipse to instantly share online. By the time the partial eclipse began, the balloon was still being inflated. The spectators who flocked to Florenceville, Bristol, looked on. Some, like Brent Taylor, are Maritimers. I thought, I just need to live long enough to see this eclipse. So I have a few hours to go, but I, it's looking good. <laughs> Others literally chased the sunny skies from New York. We got tickets, non-refundable, and booked a few hotels. And when we saw that the cloud coverage was going to be about 60% there, we changed plans at the last moment. Well, that's Former astronaut do. Chris Hadfield was even brought here to witness his first ever total solar eclipse. So I think it's magnificent that occasionally something happens where everybody goes, hey, let's all stop and look up and notice that there's stuff that's way bigger than us. Exactly what all these spectators came for. After tense minutes went by, the balloon finally <laughs> took off. Its images started streaming and the total eclipse came 20 minutes later. Totality lasting just over three minutes. It's really emotional, it's fabulous. I loved it, that was an incredible opportunity. It seems like a dream. This hasn't happened in these parts for more than a thousand years. Memories of an extraordinary day now made for everyone here under the blue skies of Western New Brunswick. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Florenceville, Bristol, New Brunswick. Mexicans in Mazatlan along the Pacific coast were spellbound as darkness fell about an hour before noon today. They kick-started the party as the first witnesses of the total eclipse as it began its path across the continent. And it looked like game day in some American cities along the path of totality. Sky watchers packing the stands in baseball and football stadiums, even the Indianapolis Speedway. And a little later in the newscast, we check in with Eric Sorensen, who went on a road trip tracing the path of totality from Toronto to Cornwall. In Ottawa, new documents have come to light at the public inquiry into foreign interference, describing briefings given to senior people in the Prime Minister's office after Global News and The Globe and Mail first reported on allegations of foreign interference by China. Our stories detailed allegations by intelligence sources that the Chinese government was attempting to target Toronto area liberal and conservative politicians and their staff. Today, the inquiry was presented with redacted versions of two new CSIS documents. David Aiken breaks down what was in them. David. Well, Donna, the initial investigations by Global News into Chinese foreign interference relied on sources in Canada's security and intelligence community that we could not name. But for at least the third time at this inquiry, information those sources provided to Global has shown up in CSIS documents put before the inquiry. The latest CSIS document is a briefing note for the Prime Minister's office dated February the 21st, 2023. It includes a section on what CSIS called, quote, unauthorized releases of classified information. That would be the news reports by Global and by the Globe and Mail. CSIS takes these leaks extremely seriously, the briefing note said. They present a direct threat to the integrity of our operations. Among other things Global News had reported was that security officials believe there was a network in Toronto that may have received as much as $250,000 from Chinese threat actors to fund the political activity of both liberal and conservative politicians and their staffs in Toronto. CISA said the politicians may not even have been aware of this network. Some of the details in that Global News report showed up in a top-secret daily foreign intelligence brief from February the 21st, 2020. That was shown to the Inquiry Monday. Much of it had been redacted, but it described this activity under the heading Subtle but Effective Interference Network, saying, 
community leaders facilitate the clandestine transfer of funds and recruit potential targets. In that 2023 briefing to the PMO, CSIS analysts said that China was indeed engaged in active interference. Quote, we know that the People's Republic of China clandestinely and deceptively interfered in both the 2019 and 2021 general elections. In both cases, these foreign interference activities were pragmatic in nature and focused primarily on supporting those viewed to be either pro-PRC or neutral on issues of interest the PRC government. Nonetheless, these security briefings to the PMO concluded that these activities by China had no impact on the overall outcome of either election. Donna. All right, David Aiken in Ottawa, thanks. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said today a date has been set for the army's long-promised offensive into the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where more than one million Palestinians have taken refuge. He didn't reveal the date, and Israel is now allowing people forced from their homes in the city of Han Yunus to return. This is what's left after the Israeli army withdrew yesterday. Piles of rubble, neighborhoods in ruins, no materials or money to rebuild, Many people can't even find where their homes once stood. At the same time, the International Court of Justice is being asked to stop Germany's supply of weapons to Israel, arguing it's enabling acts of genocide. Redmond Shannon reports. This is what many residents of Khan Yunus have returned to. Rubble and the smell of death from the bodies lying underneath. A city now unrecognizable following the withdrawal of Israeli troops from much of southern Gaza. <laughs> Ibrahim al-Najjar says his home is the best place in the world, even if it's just dust. I lived here and I'll die here, he says. Palestinian officials say they have recovered more than 60 bodies from the ruins so far. Human rights groups say Israel has failed to fulfill January's International Court of Justice recommendation to prevent a genocide in Gaza. Allegations Israel strongly rejects. On Monday, another ICJ case related to Gaza, not against Israel, but against Germany. Germany is failing to honor its own obligation to prevent genocide or to ensure respect of international humanitarian law. Nicaragua launching its case at the UN's top court, accusing Germany of breaching the genocide convention by supporting Israel's war. The Palestinian people that is being subjected to one of the most destructive military actions in modern history. Over the past five years, Germany has supplied almost one third of Israel's arms imports, second only to the US. The legacy of the Holocaust remains a driving force behind Germany's staunch support of Israel. Nicaragua wants the court to force Germany to stop supplying arms to Israel and to resume its funding for the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency. First, Nicaragua must demonstrate that there is a serious risk of genocide being committed in the Gaza Strip. Dr. Abbas Porashemi says Nicaragua will also need to establish a link between Germany and what is happening in Gaza. Germany denies Nicaragua's allegations. It will set out its defence on Tuesday. The judge's preliminary recommendations could take weeks. A final judgment at the ICJ can often take years. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. A Canadian woman has been killed in an avalanche in Switzerland, and a member of the Canadian Armed Forces is presumed dead. They were caught in a snowslide at the Zermatt Matterhorn Ski Resort a week ago. Captain Sean Thomas was on leave from deployment in the Middle East. No other members of the military were involved. He was an infantry officer with the Canadian Training Assistance Team in Jordan. He was scheduled to return home next month. The Canadian woman who died has not been identified. Plans to beef up Canada's defence budget coming up. The federal government's big cash boost in the face of new threats. After years of urgent calls for more military spending, Canada's Prime Minister has unveiled the latest defence policy, the first review since 2017. It promises to upgrade and modernise the forces and better protect Canada's Arctic sovereignty. The plan is to spend $8.1 billion over the next five years. That money is part of a larger $73 billion spending plan over the next two decades. Mercedes Stevenson has the details. We've always punched above our weight. 
Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is promising big things for the Canadian Armed Forces, admitting the military is operating in a dangerous world that it is ill-equipped for. Rising and disruptive powers like China and Russia mean NATO's northern and western flank is the Canadian Arctic. The biggest priority for the government is defending the Arctic. Planes like this one, the C-130J Hercules that we're flying back from Trenton are some of the workhorses of Canada's airports. They fly troops and equipment all over the world. But there's going to be an increasing need to get into the Arctic, not just in planes like this, but for all equipment as it becomes increasingly desirable for Canada's adversaries to operate in the north. The policy promises vehicles that can operate on ice and tundra, underwater sensors for the Arctic where hostile submarines have been detected, and it pledges military hubs in the far north. The review takes on a new and different posture for this government, one that is more forward-leaning and focuses on the ability to strike offensively as well as to defend. There will be new tactical helicopters, a long-range missile system for the Army, and aircraft that can warn of a distant missile launch. There are also more aspirational aspects, a promise to look into a new submarine fleet. There's also the question of possible new tanks and artillery. The investments, which will be in Budget 2024, will bring our defence spending to 1.76% of GDP by 2029-2030. It's a big increase in spending, but that money is heavily backloaded until after the next election, and still well short of the 2% commitment. For all the spending, people, the heartbeat of the military, are still the biggest challenge. The government is promising better care for the troops and accelerated recruiting, but it is still years away from getting back to bench strength. Uh, it will take until 2032, eight years from now, for the forces to get back to their authorized strength. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, CFB Trenton. I'll host a Global News special on the 2024 federal budget on Tuesday, April 16th, right here on Global and on all of our streaming platforms. Emergency landing ahead, another frightening moment on board a Boeing plane. Another piece has fallen off a Boeing plane, this time a Southwest Airlines flight from Denver to Houston. Let's go ahead and declare an emergency for Southwest 3695. We got a piece of the engine cowling hanging off, apparently. Part of the cover of an engine fell off and struck the wing flap. The 737-800 had reached about 10,000 feet when it happened. The pilot turned around and safely made an emergency landing. The American Federal Aviation Authority is investigating. In Mozambique, at least 94 people, including a number of children, are dead after a boat capsized off that country's north coast yesterday. Many of the passengers were fleeing because of a panic caused by disinformation about an ongoing cholera outbreak. The wooden fishing boat was overloaded. It wasn't licensed to transport people. Officials say only 12 of about 130 on board survived. 26 people are still missing. Actor Jonathan Majors was sentenced in New York City today after being convicted last year of assaulting his girlfriend. The actor had faced up to a year behind bars, but the judge gave him a year's probation and ordered him to complete a 52-week in-person domestic violence intervention program. Majors' former girlfriend has filed a civil suit against him for physical and emotional abuse. The actor says he's innocent and plans to appeal. He was dropped by Marvel Studios after his conviction. Next, Eric Sorensen moonlights as an eclipse chaser for a day, road tripping from Toronto to Cornwall to experience this extraordinary event. There's actually a name for people who chase eclipses. They're called Umbra Files, which means lover of shadows. They say seeing one total eclipse can make you long for another. And because they're rare events, because the path of totality is different every time, it means you have to hit the road. Our Eric Sorensen went on his own eclipse expedition in Ontario, seeking out those who were looking up at the sky. Clouds were gathering in Toronto, so... We set off chasing the eclipse. Stupid clouds. And we weren't alone. The overcast skies creating a small convoy of eclipse fanatics. Going past Coburg, so we're in the zone of totality. It's still overcast. Stupid clouds. At the rest stops, we encounter kindred spirits, Ryan Garner and his family. We're going to go to Kingston, but yeah. we're checking the like cloud data. Elizabeth and Steve Williams are headed for Sandbanks. 
Hopefully oh. there'll be a break in the clouds. Yeah. 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 But we're going to see the uh, eclipse and watch it as the as it goes dark and that'll be really neat. Well, yeah. We got to keep yeah. heading east. Heading down Highway 401, it's Cornwall or bust. A race against time as our vehicle, the clouds and the moon's path all head east as we search for clear skies. At Mallory Town, we found the Hamiltons who've come from England to see the eclipse, which they've seen twice before. Why do you want to see it a third time? It's kind of addictive. Yeah. yeah. When you've seen one, the first thing you say is, when can I see another one? So we're off again. Stupid clouds still around. Of course, we have to keep an eye looking back, making sure the moon isn't catching up to us. Finally, Cornwall. Time is short. The crowds are here. The Saunders clan from Toronto and Ottawa, both outside the zone of totality, have converged here to see one of the wonders of the solar system. But I've never seen a total eclipse before and I don't think I'll ever see another one in my life. Darkness descends, the temperature drops, and the clouds cleared for a glorious view of totality. It's just a sliver. It's a sliver. As imagined, maybe even better. It was far more dramatic than I ever anticipated. It was like the lights went out. For a few moments we were in darkness, it got colder, things got very still, incredible. And I can't believe I'm getting emotional about it, but you know, it's such a, you know, it's a cliche, but it is a once in a lifetime thing. A memory for life. Time to head back west towards the setting sun. I hope it's cloudy. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Cornwall, Ontario. That is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. There were so many people looking up across North America today. We wanted to leave you with a few more images. If it was cloudy where you were, there will be another total eclipse visible from Canada in 20 years. Plenty of time to plan for that one. Thanks for watching and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.